the uh, Henri OHD1 is sort of like the greatest ace maker of World War I that you've almost never heard of. And it's, uh, it was an excellent plane, it was a good looking plane. Uh, people who looked at it are probably impressed with it. But when they see the name, they wonder what the hell is that? And sounds French. How much service did it have with the French? To which the answer is none, except maybe in a movie. It's, it was nevertheless a significant fighter in two other air arms that we seldom pay attention to. And as a matter of fact, recent research has shown that it was in fact built to one of those, a specification laid down by one of those foreign air arms in seeking out a plane of their own. It was essentially an Italian fighter uh, designed by a French firm at Italy's request. And it's, a, it's an interesting story in itself. So uh, we'll look at the pedigree of the Enrio HD1, if I can uh, advance it. In it uh, the Italian front was, of course, a bit behind the curve when it came to fighter aircraft. First of all, Italy didn't enter the war until May 1915 when after sitting on the fence and deciding which way it would be most profitable to go, it decided to jump into the Allied camp and attack Austria-Hungary in hopes of grabbing more land along the Adriatic, and was promptly stopped in its tracks by an army one-sixth its size, starting a miserable long war at the foothills of the Alps. In April 1916, the first Italian fighters began to make an appearance. Now, Italy had already come up with the concept of a fighter as early as October 1914, as designed by Gianni Caproni, which basically had a Lewis machine gun mounted on a pedestal to fire over the propeller. And you can see this now in the Museum of Flight in Seattle in its original form. Unfortunately for the Italians, uh, Giulio Duhet had the main uh, influence and he was insistent that the bomber is all you need to win a war and had Caproni devote his production entirely to his superb tri-motor bombers. So that when the realities of war on the Western Front made its way to Italy. In February 1916, the first Fokker Eindeckers started shooting down Capronis. Mind you, the Austro-Hungarians were also late covers when it came to coming up with a fighter. The Italians started importing French Nieuports and began scoring victories in them in April 1916. And uh, Maki, a firm which had resisted the Italian trend to devote yourself to bomber aircraft, uh, took out a license to build Newport 11s and uh, later 17s. What's shown here is an example of a Maquis built Newport uh, 11, and they would be using those as late as 1918. But the Italians were, uh, they had much as the United States had, after having invented the airplane, it went into a hiatus of underdevelopment while Europe took the lead. So it, Italian fighter development since Caproni CA-20 had gone into a long dormant period that they would have to wake up from, but they needed a fighter and they soon decided that the maneuverable but frail Newport 611 would not be, would soon be outclassed and they needed something better and they needed it fast. So, a uh, General uh, Beltramo, Hermano Beltramo, the Italian military aviation mission to Paris, 
contacted a French company, uh, René and Marcel Henriot, and gave them an idea, as he wrote it. Of my own initiative, I asked Mr. Henriot if he were willing to build, without obligation, a single-seat fighter following the concepts which I would suggest in order to create a type better suited than the Newport to the fighter needs of our theater of operations. Mr. Henriot accepted with enthusiasm the proposed criteria. Key to the design and development of the aircraft, the belt-fed Vickers machine gun with gun sight. Use of the 120 horsepower Gnome Aeron engine. Two hours of flight endurance, climbing performance, and high altitude handling superior to those of the Newport. Now, Henriot was more than willing to take up this challenge because they weren't doing that well as a builder of original aircraft. Uh, Alfred Pognier had uh, come up with a fighter design for them, and they built it in small numbers for the French Air Service. It is shown here being test flown by the 12 Victory Ace Jean Navarre. You'll notice that it also has a Lewis machine gun firing over the propeller huff. Uh, the propeller, but being a biplane, that's a whole lot more stable to mount than it would be if it were on the pedestal on a Caproni monoplane. But the Pognier turned out to be an ill-proportioned, not very good-looking plane that flew even worse than it looked. In January 1916, another illustrious French ace, Charles Nungesseur, took one of the Pognes up for a test flight, lost control of it, crashed, and broke practically every bone in his body. He was taken to hospital where they expected him to die shortly. He didn't. They operated on him, pretty sure that it was a lost cause, Three months later, he was walking again on a cane and crutches and insisting that he fly again. He went on, of course, to become a 43 victory ace. Nevertheless, it said a lot about his powers of endurance and what a tough cookie ninja there was. It also said worlds about what a crappy fighter the Pognier M1 was. This gives you an overall view of the plane, and this specimen is one of ten that somehow got sold to a country desperate enough to take anything that was proffered to it, Belgium. The Belgian Air Service used some of them. They didn't like them. They didn't use them much, and as so it also, though, left a bad taste in the Belgian palate toward anything made by Pognier or by Henriot, of which more later. By the time Henriot went back to the drawing board over anything, the French had decided that the successor for the new poor would be the Spad 7. They were so Spad happy that there was nothing any other French firm could come up with to displace it, and uh, Henriot ended up subcontracting to build Sopwith one and a half strutters, or as the French version was called, the Sopwith uh, 1A2 or 1B1. It was during this period, in any case, that we'll see another link in the uh, story, because Henriot became accept. Uh, accustomed to building that W-shaped cabane strut arrangement that gave the one and a half strutter its nickname. And which uh, you'll see here in the fighter that they designed with the help of uh, Marcel Dupont, their chief designer, he came up with a, fi a fighter to the Italian specification that met it in every respect. 
you'll notice the W-shaped uh, Cabane strut arrangement, virtually identical to that of the one and a half strutter. But there are some original points too. Unlike the Newport, this is not a sesquiplane, but a true biplane with uh, struts splayed outward, generous rudder, an equally generous headrest. But a well-proportioned plane, uh, it has a similar formula to stability as used in the Sopwith Camel, except an opposite approach. On the Sopwith Camel, you had a straight upper wing and dihedral on the lower wing that was twice that of the dihedral on a Sopwith Puff. In the case of the REO, the dihedral is on the upper wing, and the lower wing is straight. But the effect on maneuverability seems to have been similar. It was test flown by the Italians and ex quickly accepted. It could do 115 miles per hour at ground level and uh, 111 at about 6,000 feet. It could climb well. It maneuvered well. It was everything a fighter should be, except uh, by the time it came out in late 1917, the single synchronized Vickers machine gun was starting to prove inadequate against the twin machine guns that the Germans had introduced on their Albatross D1, D2, and D3, which virtually tripled the rate of fire since with a single machine gun, with the propellers in the way, it automatically shuts off. The result is a pop, pop, pop with a double machine gun. Well, the interrupter gear is turning one machine gun off, the other is still firing. So you can get a whole lot more shots off. But other than that, the Italians found it acceptable and soon began adopting it, starting with the 76 Squadrilia. And by uh, their first victory would be occur in July 1917 and soon the 78th at Borgnano received them as well. Uh, they had their first uh, victories and their first uh, losses around July but they were only in small amounts and there were only 16 REOs between the two squadrons available when the disaster at Caporetto occurred on October 26, 1917. And with the Italian army in full retreat, both squadrilli had no choice at the time but to burn all 16 of their aircraft on, uh, on the field. <coughs> After the Italians dug in their heels again on the south end of the Piave River and uh, new aerodromes were being established, new Henriots were being delivered to the uh, 82nd, the 70th, the 72nd, and 78th and 76th Squadrilli. And uh, as of November 5th they were ready to resume operations again. Uh, they fought 22 times by the end of the year and claimed 11 victories without any losses. This is an example of uh, an REO with a 76 Squadrilia. And this is another. The unit had its number up front and on the uh, side of the upper side of the wing. And each pilot had a personal marking that he included here. Let's see if I can identify one of them. Uh, <coughs> Mario Fuccini had the lightning bolt, for one example, and uh, Tenente Giuseppe Retino flew this one. One of the most famous pilots to fly it was Silvio Scaroni, whose personal marking was a simple white box aft of the uh, insignia. His, he is known for flying in trio with two other aces, uh, 
Romolo Tucconi, and uh, and Giorgio Michetti, who is the fellow standing uh, to on, to his right, and who had a seahorse as a personal marking. These three uh, were a bit of a cleanup trio for the 76th. Uh, Ticoni ended up with six victories, Michetti with five, and Scaroni with 26, the second ranking ace in the Italian Army Air Service. On now, this picture may have been taken in the wake of one of the earliest triumphs for the uh, Italian REOs. It began, interestingly enough, when two Canadians of number 26 Squadron Royal Flying Corps got bored with the fact that the, there wasn't much going on over the front on December 25th, 1917. Well, why would there be? It was Christmas, for God's sake. But uh, the aggressive Captain William George Barker just wanted some action from the Austro-Hungarians, and he didn't think he was getting any. So with uh, Lieutenant Harold Byron Hudson, they left Mota di Lavenza Air Aerodrome, went 10 miles into enemy territory, went over an aerodrome, dropped a large piece of cardboard saying to the Austrian Flying Corps from the English RFC, wishing you a Merry Christmas, eh? And then shot up the place. <laughs> well, the occupants of the airfield were not amused at this unchivalrous treatment of Christmas, but they were not Austro-Hungarians. They were Fliegerabteilung II, a contingent of German two-seaters who had come in to help the Austro-Hungarians, even while the French and British were sending units in to help the Italians. And they set out to uh, raid the British airfield that had, uh, they thought, responsible for this outrage. But they didn't attack Mota di Lavenza, they attacked uh, Istrana airfield home base of the 76th and 82nd Squadrilli, who were just dying to get revenge for Caporetto on anybody. And for some reason, although they had three Jagdstaffeln in Italy, the Germans didn't send any fighters to escort their DFW C-5s. So the Germans ran into a hornet's nest, which included Michetti and Scaroni and numerous other Aces are aces to be, and they got their clocks clean. This is the Italians looking over one of several uh, DFWs that were shot down by the Italians. The Germans sent in a second wave that included AEG bombers, and two of those were shot down as well. Uh, in one case by Scaroni and Alfredo Brenta of the 82nd, and uh, Jack Mitchell of number 28 squadron, a camel pilot who got involved. Uh, this is one of the planes of the 82nd. They used letters to, for individual pilots, much as the British did, which would result in some interesting confusion, as I will soon mention. Uh, there is Mitchell's plane, in which he co-shot down one of the AEG-2 engine bombers. And in the, another interesting example of uh, personal markings in the 76th Squadrilla, these uh, four aces are the marking of uh, Mario Torello Baracchini, who ended up with 21 victories. Anyway, the, um, the El Rio had certainly proven itself, but as I mentioned, some of them happened to have letters as markings, which led to some confusion with the British, not to mention the fact that neither the Germans nor the Austro-Hungarians ha had as high an opinion of the Italians as the aggressive British, and they assumed any radial engine plane they encountered to be sopped with camels, which had a reputation, and so did the British. 
Now, in the case of the professionalism and courage of the Italian fighter pilots, this was entirely unwarranted and unfair, for one thing, and the Italians resented it, and rightly so. And mistaking their, their aircraft for camels was equally unfair. The Henriots, is, from the research I've done into the subject, were uh, actually taking quite a toll on the enemy. What are the colorings in, an, in the Italian national uh, insignia? Red, white, and green. Red, uh, green. Yeah. Oh, well, that was another problem. The British were blue, white, red. The Italians were green, white, red. So it was pretty easy also to mix the nationalities apart on those grounds. So the, uh, the result is the Italians are getting... Uh, are having to fight against the reputation of the camel over everything. And a lot of times there are dogfights where the Austro-Hungarians are claiming they've encountered camels. In the case of uh, Frank Linga Crawford, it's very possible he ran into both the day he died, first shot up by a camel of number 45 squadron, and then as he was trying to bring his Berg D-1 out of its uh, dive, got jumped by... Mario HD1s from the uh, 81st Squadrilla, which shot him down and killed him, resulting in pilots of both units getting credit for the same plane. As for Scaroni, he just kept uh, adding to his score until July 12, 1918, when he final. but I'll get to that momentarily. This is uh, Michetti with his seahorse decorated uh, HD-1. And these are aircraft of the 81st Squadrilla, which could often be pretty colorful. The one flying in is uh, in red, white, and green markings. And uh, this fellow's got a rather star-spangled approach, which has uh, been a boon to modelers looking for something different. There's the same plane, which apparently had its uh, silvery finish overpainted in white, but in such a way that the silver shone through in star form. Now, notice the serial number HD562. This is one of about an original order of 50 later increased, I believe, to 150 Henriot built planes that were supposed to tide the Italians over until Maquis could get production underway. They would go on to build uh, hundreds more that are identifiable by an HD and a serial number on the fuselage as shown on this plane, flown the last plane flown by Scaroni. You'll also notice that he has mounted twin Vickers on his plane, uh, which somewhat downgraded performance with the added weight, but he wanted the firepower. And on, uh, as mentioned, on July 12th, he got into a dogfight with Flieger Company 14 and its... Uh, Phoenix D-2 fighters, and although he shot down his 26th and last, he was a shot down himself, badly injured, and that was the end of the war for him. But in any case, by the end of World War I, the Ario HD-1 was the backbone of the Italian fighter force, and would continue to be so into the 1920s. Meanwhile, the Henrio was getting a chance at some kind of glory on the Western Front, not from the French, but from the Belgians. HD number one here is the first Henrio to be purchased by the Belgian Air, Army Air Service, and it has the yellow uh, fuselage markings of the man it's intended to be uh, handed to, uh, André de Mellemeister of the first Escadrille de Chasse. But uh, 
When it arrived in uh, October of 1917, the Belgians still remembered the Pognier. So they had a jaundiced eye for anything that looked even vaguely like it, although, frankly, the Henriot was much better looking. Nevertheless, it was associated with it, and de Mellemeister promptly said, I have no interest in this airplane. I'm perfectly happy with my Newport 17, thank you. And he turned to a, another be veteran Belgian flyer, uh, Jan Olislagers, said, well, you can have it. And Olislagers said, well, if you don't like it, that's good enough for me. I don't want it. One Belgian pilot after another would not even test fly the thing until it went down to one of the junior members of the Escadrille, uh, Willie Coppens. Coppens at the time uh, was flying an old Newport 16, which was like the 11, but with a 120-horsepower uh, engine instead of an 80-horsepower engine, which added weight, threw it off balance, and in terms of handling, uh, he told me himself he considered it a disagreeable little beast. And he hated it. He was probably the last person to fly a Newport 16 over the Western Front. He had a uh, blue uh, paper horse emblem on the side, which was apparently his chosen uh, personal marking at the time. But he accomplished nothing in it except at least to stay alive. So when the REO came his way by default, he said, uh, I'm willing to try anything. I'll take it up. So he did. And he loved it. The thing handled beautifully. And he came back and he said, what's the matter with you people? This is a great plane. It's better than the Newport 17. So they flew it each in their turn and uh, they did like it. Now the REO was originally uh, delivered, you'll notice, had the machine gun offset in, uh, in the crook of one of the W-shaped struts. Uh, this put the aim off a little, and in later versions, the Belgians and the Italians would mount it in the center. Now here is one of the ones that began to make its way into the first escadrille. This was flown by Jan Oli Slagers until he had a mishap while landing at the airfield. <coughs> In February, er, uh, January, February 1918, the uh, Belgian Air Force underwent a reorganization, and the first escadrille was redesignated the ninth. And it was also uh, it also adapted a unit emblem for the first time, a thistle, with the uh, with the Latin motto, which was applied on the upper uh, headrest. Uh, Nemo mi impune l'assassin. No one disturbs me without with impunity. Uh, Coppens, who was uh, besides falling in love with the Henriot, decided to develop its potential. In, on February 18th, he flew 50 kilometers behind enemy lines just to fly over his hometown of Brussels and around the home where his father and mother were just so he could wave hello and then flew all the way back to Belgian lines. This was the first uh, case of his making a name for himself. But uh, within the next two months of that, he shot down his first balloon and realized that he had a talent for this and he soon began shooting down more. He admitted that uh, the first ones were out of hatred for the enemy, but future ones were done out of pride. When he was flying HD number 24, he got his fifth victory on May 19, 1918. He's shown here being congratulated by the first Belgian ace, Fernand Jacquet, who by then was commander of the all three of the Belgian fighter squadrons. Jan Olislagers is here, also uh, wishing hearty congratulations, and Andre de Villemeister is too. Because Coppens has just become an ace. 
Uh, Corbins would uh, fly a number of Henriots, including one with an 11 millimeter balloon busting gun, lent him by the French. And uh, he would also, in one case, received one that had a hand, uh, a hand painted camouflage pattern that he said looked like an ugly snake and he didn't like it at all, so he overpainted it in a royal blue on uh, at least two of his aircraft, which would earn him the nickname the Blue Devil from the Germans. De Mellemaster also took up a plane of his own, which had the unit emblem. You can see the motto on the headrest. The uh, vertical stabilizer on all aircraft in his flight was his personal color of yellow. He ended up with 11 victories. Coppens would get a grand total of 37, of which 35 were balloons, making him the greatest balloon buster in history. His luck would finally catch up with him, as it did to so many other balloon busters, though, on October 14, 1918, after getting his third of the day, he was struck in an artery, Determined not to be taken by the hated Germans, he flew as fast as he could to Allied lines as he was losing consciousness to keep himself awake. He threw aside, he stuffed his helmet into his jacket but threw away his goggles. Just barely made it across the lines and landed before he collapsed, was rushed to hospital where his leg had to be amputated. He was, though, one of the luckier ones. He would live to be 95. <laughs> Meanwhile, the French finally took an interest in the Henriot, if not as a, for the, army, the aviation militaire. The French Navy were interested in a float plane version, the HD-2, and uh, these are one of many units that flew them off the Flanders coast. Besides the floats, they had an enlarged uh, vertical stabilizer and rudder, and unless you're from Pensacola where you can actually see one, you may not be aware of the fact that the United States Navy adopted the HD-2 as well, and were operating them off the Flanders coast, and would continue to operate them after the war with uh, naval fighter experiments that included inflatable bags, as shown underneath this one, for the necessity of landing in the water before aircraft carriers were perfected. And they were also used for experiments in launching off uh, warships, in this case the battleship Texas. Uh, in this case, the HD-2 has been modified into a land plane version, and the one that's in Pensacola is done up in the markings of Texas's uh, resident HD-2. Yet another, uh, Henriot's began either being tested by or being used by air arms after the war, besides Italy and Belgium, it was also used in Switzerland, and one of them made its way out west to Hollywood, where they did a movie that starred a certain World War I ace who was trying to keep his hand in, Charles Nungesser, and it bore his markings, his personal mark of a black, uh, black heart, two candles, a coffin, and a skull and crossbones. There's Nungesser himself alongside the plane, which he certainly could handle as well as any of the many others he flew, although he never flew it in wartime. But he did get to fly it in the Sky Raider, a 1925 movie with the world's greatest living ace, which isn't quite true, but hey, it's Hollywood, in uh, what no doubt was not that different a role from the one he played in World War I. If uh, any of what I've heard from Lafayette Flying Corps men over the amount of women he won over when he wasn't shooting down Germans, doesn't seem that far off the mark. 
I don't know how successful he was as an actor, but he did get to fly his own airplane, and he did get to uh, a screen credit under his uh, under his belt. Here is a rare scene from the movie showing uh, ninjas are doing something he probably never did in the actual war. But uh, one good thing about showbiz, that uh, old Henriot of his has lived, lived out the years and is now in the Plains of Fame Museum in Chino, California. Other Henriots live on. There is one in, uh, I believe, Jan Olislager's markings. He had six victories. Uh, in the RAF Museum, there is another one in Belgium and at least one, and I'm sure there are more, in Italy. One of them has Baracchini's markings. And there is the HD2 that has been preserved in Pensacola. So it's not exactly an unknown plane, and yet, in the shadow of the Sopwith camel, it has been. But I will say this. By the end of the war... Somebody must have been catching on, because according to Scaroni, by the time the Italians won their final victory at Vittorio Veneto, a captured Austro-Hungarian pilot intimated to him that the fighter they most feared were the planes with the V wings. And when it came to being noticed for that, that could have only referred to their HD-1s. So there's a plane that needs a, perhaps a little more respect than it's got. I, for one, have been trying to help in that respect, and uh, we may be seeing more of them in future. But uh, if you go to the right museum, you still can see one. Any questions? <laughs>